Thank you very much uh, for attending this uh, interview, uh, Barbara. You're very welcome. Very happy to be here. And my first question is uh, that, but you can introduce yourself. So uh, what is your profession and what is the Applied Degradation Network? Uh, well, what is my profession is always an interesting question because probably like many of us, I have multiple hats. Um, but in short, I am a, I'm a psychologist by root discipline. I'm a professor of conflict resolution uh, at multiple universities, but fundamentally here in Portland, Oregon, where I live. I do a lot of training and facilitating and consulting globally in different regions. And I am an improviser and applied improviser, which means I use improvisation for all of those things. And occasionally, if people are brave, they let me on stage to perform. <laughs> and um, I am president of the Applied Improvisation Network, which is a wonderful uh, organization of people around the world who use these methods for all kinds of things, like training, facilitation, working with refugees, working with disaster relief, working with leadership, working with conflict resolution, working with people with dementia, working with uh, business negotiations, working with pretty much anything where people are involved, improvisation is useful. So that sounds that you're uh, in, in theory, like being in research and in practice. Um, is improvisation more a practical thing or more a theoretical thing from your point of view? Oh, that's a trick question, Lucas, you know that. Um, well, of course it's both. Uh, so it's very practical. I use it every day in my life. Um, on my better days. And um, it is absolutely uh, work that is muscle we can be building. It is um, a mindset. It is skill. It is also theory. It is also about um, what we believe about people and connection and humanity and relationship and co-creation. And much to people's surprise, improvisation is not just people getting together and making things up. I mean, that's part of it, but you're making it up with a foundational theoretical framework and base of philosophy and set of guidelines and principles. So it's absolutely, you know, from my perspective, the beautiful balance of, of theory and practice. So what I hear is that you can apply improvisation in various contexts. Now, some people have never heard about improvisation as a professional discipline, so to say. So, so what, what is improvisation? How could you explain that for people who have not so much uh, insight in this field? Uh, well, I'm so glad you asked that question uh, because actually we're doing it right now, aren't we? Um, we didn't script this conversation. Um, we are co-creating something together. I'm following your lead, you're following mine. So actually, um, improvisation is, um, and it's actually on one of my slides that I'm going to share later, it's, it's really um, co-creating and collaborating in the moment without a script. And that's a um, fundamental principle and, and action that is useful anywhere. So um that's it i mean again i'm gonna jump ahead but if i were to ask this group how many of you are improvisers maybe a few people would raise their hand but actually if i were to ask this group how many of you are improvisers i want everybody to raise their hand because nobody wakes up with a script we are all adapting and, and co-creating throughout our days and that's what improvisation is is working with what's in front of us to make the next best choice in the moment. So some people connect improvisation also, also with um, creativity or innovation. Where do you see similarities or differences between these broad fields? Well, uh, yes. Um, improvisation is fundamentally innovative because you're creating something that has never existed before. Right? Each improvisation is a new 
moment and a new opportunity. And that's really what innovation is, is creating something um, from nothing or creating something new. Uh, creativity is really using what's in front of you, imagining things that didn't exist or couldn't exist before this configuration of people and time, right? So, so the notion of improvisation is also ensemble based, right? I mean, somebody can improvise as an individual, sure, but fundamentally in our work, it's about what people can co-create together. So really what people co-create together could never exist in another moment because that, that exact moment has never been there and will never be there again. And creativity is about using what's in front of you, making interesting choices, finding out what happens, pivoting when something doesn't work, using the mistakes that happen. And that's the beautiful thing that we can learn to do uh, in any situation. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm not the creative kind of, of person. I will never uh, learn to improvise. So what do you think? Can you learn to improvise and to be more creative? Well, yes, another leading question, my friend. Of course, of course. Um, it's like saying, um, you know, I can't do X. I mean, some of us, I think, are more predisposed to certain things. I will never be a great visual artist, but it doesn't mean I don't have creativity. So my creativity shows up in other ways. And it is absolutely a muscle we can build. And that's a lot of uh, what this work is about, is the exercises we do, the trainings we facilitate, the activities that we participate in, are literally working the skill and building the muscle of all the things we're talking about, including creativity. I remember when I first started doing improvisation, which you know fundamentally I fell into pretty accidentally, I, I would wake up in the morning with my brain just like imagining all kinds of things and I would start keeping a book next to my bed because the things that were popping into my brain, not dreams, but ideas or thoughts or um, possibilities for projects or ideas or stories were just, they were just pouring out of me. And it was because I was opening those portals and, and really inviting that part of my brain into awareness. That's really what it is. Now, how can you train these skills? So you mentioned some, uh, like two times the muscles. So I imagine like if I go to the gym, I train specific muscles or muscle groups. Yes. What kind of muscles, what kind of skills can you train in improv sessions? Yes, well, wonderful question again. So our dear colleague, Kat Coppett, who is going to be one of your teachers, talks about the improv gym. Right, and that is exactly kind of how we see it. So any of the, the facets of what makes somebody a good improviser are muscles we can work and activities we can, we can build. So we can work the muscles of listening or we can work the muscles of presence or we can work the muscles of awareness or we can work the muscles of spontaneity or flexibility or collaboration. Uh, all the things that com comprise the, the process of improvisation are skill sets that we can develop. And improvisers who perform on stage are doing that very thing. Again, they're not just good actors, because there are plenty of good actors who are terrible improvisers, because they have not worked those muscles. They're very good at getting into a character or reading from a script. But if you threw them on a stage with other improvisers, they wouldn't be very agile because they haven't worked those muscles. So it is absolutely the training that good performance improvisers actually participate in. So sometimes people associate with improvisation like music or theater. Now, if you talk about applied improvisation, that means that you use these skills for um, you know, an organization, for example, or teams, or leadership. Um, so, so what is the difference if you train as an actor or improv actor compared to a non-actor, so to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So the way I like to think about it is that applied improvisation includes, for example, theater and music. So we are applying the principles and practices of improvisation 
to performance theater or music, right? We're applying it in those places. In the work that I think we're talking about here, we are applying the principles and practices of improvisation to leadership training or to conflict resolution or to working with refugees. And I think the, the fundamental difference is that we use these skills and principles activities to engage people. So in performance, the audience is watching, right? In applied improvisation, the, the group is participating in activities that we invite people into, and then we reflect on the activities. So the notion of a debrief or reflecting on what's happened or what people experienced and how that applies to their real world scenarios is one of the critical differences. Uh, so um, Tiagi, one of our you know, uh, experiential education colleagues says that you know, learning happens more from reflecting on an activity than actually the activity itself. So we take the time to ask those questions. What did you notice? What happened? How does that relate to whatever it is your real world situation is? And then what might you do differently? as a result of these insights and experiences. So that's a little bit of the difference that the audience in a performance is watching and listening, whereas the participants in the kind of work we're doing are par participating in the experience and they are often and hopefully changed and transformed by it. Now, one of your um, area is conflict resolution. And I think you traveled more or less the whole world <laughs> Uh, to work with various organizations and institutions. Now, this is a, a real-world problem. Um, how do you apply improvisational techniques coming from arts to such um, really big problems? Very carefully. <laughs> uh, that was one of my big questions for myself when I first discovered improvisation and applied improvisation because I knew intuitively that it was this very powerful tool and very transformative tool. And yet I also knew that I was in these very serious kind of life and death, you know, world problem situations. And I didn't want to bring things that people might see or experience as frivolous, right? Because these kinds of activities could be seen as frivolous, even though I know, and I think you know that they're not. So I think it's really about uh, knowing your audience. It's about building safety. You don't do anything that you think people will feel unsafe with or not ready for. It's about building trust and credibility so that people will walk with you on this path to do things that they might be curious about. It's about scaling. You know, I wouldn't walk into a new group of, of refugee communities that I'm working with and just jump into crazy dancing around. I mean, somebody might, and that's fine if that works for them. But I might start with, you know, more subtle connecting kinds of activities and then build up. But that's the other thing about improvisation is that I could walk in with a whole menu of what I want to do in a group and within five minutes, it's out the window because if I'm a good facilitator and a good applied improviser, I'm reading the room and receiving the messages they're telling me, which says they're ready, they're not ready, they're willing, they're not willing, they're safe, they're not safe, they're, they're agile or not agile for this moment. So I have to make decisions in the moment about the activities that I might choose to use. So my strategy is I come in with a whole list of things. I, you know, like I have a whole, you know, list of things I might do um, in any situation. And then I will choose based on what I'm seeing in the moment. Now, until March this year, most of uh, improv workshops and applied improvisation sessions uh, were not online. They were, as you said, you're walking into a room, you, you, you feel the people, you recognize some movements, you're building trust and so on. Now, the world changed dramatically in the last month. And Has it? I didn't notice. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but there, there was this little um, virus. It's, it's changed. Uh, some people say that it changed. Um, and um, it changed, for example, that most of the workshops are online. So what is the difference from your point of view having um, 
improv workshops online versus offline? Well, <laughs> uh, many things and many surprises as well, right? So certainly online, it's more difficult to do a lot of the physical ensemble kind of work, but actually surprisingly, there is stuff we can do. I think online we're missing each other's literal or metaphoric touch or, or, or air, breath. You know, being in a room with people is energetically different than being on a screen with them. This is true. I think our ability to be fluid in navigating the space is different. You know, I have to be much more intentional about what I do with people. Uh, we can't be synchronous in the same way. You know, there are activities we can't do where it's like talk in one voice because literally we can't do that on this screen. But what I'm finding, and this is where it comes down to the principles. First of all, it is amazing the activities we can do on Zoom and I'm learning so much about what's possible. I mean, full disclosure, I've never wanted to be online. I'm one of the last Luddites in the, in the universe and I would always choose to be in a room with people before being online. And you've asked me to come to Austria several times and I couldn't because of timing or travel and here I am, right? So the beauty of that, of course, is our more global accessibility. accessibility. But what I do think is the most important is remembering what it is that is important in what it is we're trying to teach. And I will say that in the, in the classes I've been teaching, not just um, improvisation, I teach classes on dialogue or conflict resolution or, or other leadership, other kinds of things that draw from these skills and activities that the essence of what people are really craving during this time is connection, is listening, is co-creation, is being quote unquote in a room with people. So if I design activities around that, which they are many, then I think we, we achieve our goal. I recently completed a dialogue class and people couldn't believe what we were able to achieve online. You know, people were afraid that, you know, we're not gonna be able to do anything. And it's really about the essence of what you bring to this moment that, that I think makes the difference. And like anything, there are advantages and challenges to each format. Now, um, if people attend an online or offline uh, workshop on applied improvisation, uh, what do you think, what can they learn for their professional life? What's maybe changed after, after that? Well, I can speak only for myself and anybody I know who's participated. For me, it was everything changed, actually. So when I discovered this work, everything changed. How I saw the world, how I engaged with the world, the work that I did, the possibilities that I saw, the methods that I used, um, who I was as a person, really changed, actually. And I, I, I don't, I'm not making that up to be kind of the uh, evangelist. It's, it's really true. Um, and so I think it's really how much anybody receives and engages with this content. I, I know a lot of people might take one improv class because they, they want to dabble or they want to be better at public speaking. And, you know, they, they dip their toe in. I kind of dove in. Um, but I do think the methods and the principles are applicable to everything. So it's, it's how much you want to carry this and, and, and use it. And the last question um, is the Applied Improvisation Network. So what, what is it? What can you um, imagine if people do not know this network? Well, <clears throat> we're a, <clears throat> a group of people around the world. Um, many thousands of people who have discovered the use of these methods for their work, who um, we meet um, annually, not this year, we were supposed to meet in Spain and we've deferred to next year. Uh, in a conference, we have a very active Facebook group. We have a um, evolving website. We have local and regional groups of people who use 
these methods and principles in all kinds of ways. There are people who do writing together, lots of projects emerge, and it's incredibly generous community. It's uh, a community of people who sometimes call themselves a tribe, uh, but it's also a highly professional community of researchers, practitioners, performers, trainers, facilitators who understand the benefit of this practice. And one of the reasons I think it's grown so much, the, the network was started um, in 2002 by a number of people, including Kat Coppett and Paul Z. Jackson, who was one of the co-founders, who's also one of your trainers, um, with a small group of, you know, 35 people in a room at a, at a you know, facilitation conference. And now we're, you know, thousands of people around the world. And one of the reasons that it's grown so much is not only that people see and understand the, the power of this practice, but it's also really being legitimized by, you know, incredibly prolific and very visible authors like Malcolm Gladwell and Daniel Pink. And, you know, we have it being used at Harvard and Google and London School of Economics and Pixar and Disney and, and all kinds of people and organizations that understand um, people writing about trauma, you know, who are talking about the power of improvisation to work through trauma. So it's, it's being legitimized and, and grown, not just because there are a bunch of improvisers who get it, but the rest of the world is getting it. And as an organization, the Applied Improvisation Network really, really wants to be able to hold that space for, for everybody who, who gets it. And we're growing and we're developing all kinds of things. We're gonna be doing all kinds of things this year around topical symposia on, on core topics that are very current and alive in this current um, crisis. And we see ourselves being um, very responsive to world events as well as growing a body of work you know, researchers, authors, and um, wanting to spread the word. Thank you.